Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is going to be another bonus recommendations video for you. For this time, uh, I'm going to give you some bonus recommendations for the prompt of space. But before we get into that, I need to show you the book that I found that fit the prompts for our last round of our m and Manuscript Matchup game. Now, for this round, uh, we needed to find a book that uh, had a male detective and that had something to do with weather or the environment. So how could I not talk about Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie? The male detective, of course, is Hercule Poirot, and um, weather and the environment play a huge part in this story because the train gets stopped by snow. They are stuck on the train because of the snow, and the murder happens, and so it's very much an isolated, closed circle type of a mystery, and the snow it plays a huge part in that because, of course, they are able to see if there are any footprints in the snow leading to or from, you know, the the train, um, and of course they're stuck where they are because of the snow on the tracks. This is my choice for that um, for that uh, prompt. Stay tuned to the end of this video when we will play another round of the Eminem Manuscript Matchup game. All right, so here are some bonus recommendations for the prompt space. I have four Christie commendations. This is A Pocket Full of Rye from 1953, and it is a Miss Marple, um, and a man named Rex, what was his last name? Sorry, I should have checked. Rex um, Fortescue. Uh, is found dead in his office and he's got rye in his pocket, just loose in his pocket. So Many Steps to Death from 1954. This is also called Destination Unknown. A lovely red-haired Hilary Craven wanted to take her life. Then a man entered the picture and after he told her the strange story of a disappearing scientist, Hillary agreed to take on another woman's identity and a daring secret mission into the African desert without the slightest chance of coming back alive. The Murder at the Vicarage from 1930. This is the very first Miss Marple and it is set in St. Mary Mead and Colonel Prothero is found murdered in the Vicar's study. The Murder on the Links from 1923. This is Hercule Poirot and he goes over to France to help solve a murder in response to a letter that he received asking for help. Okay, let's get into some historical recommendations. Um, I have a couple from the Amelia Peabody series by Elizabeth Peters. This is The Crocodile on the Sandbank. This is the first in the series from 1975 where we are introduced to the wonderful Amelia Peabody. This is set in the Victorian time period and she decides to go over to Egypt all on her own um, and she meets a woman on her trip named Evelyn and uh, then when they get to Egypt they meet the um, Emerson brothers and, uh, and then weird things start happening, uh, including a mummy that starts appearing. So this is a great introduction to a really, really fabulous series. And then this is Lion in the Valley from 1986. It's the fourth in that series, and it is set during the 1895-96 season uh, in Egypt. The Alehouse Murders by Maureen Ash from 2007. This is the first in her um, Templar Knight series. After eight years of captivity in the Holy Land, Templar Bascot de Marins escapes with injuries to his body and soul. Now on a sojourn at Lincoln Castle, he hopes to regain his strength and mend his waning faith. But not even the peace of God's countryside is safe from the mortal crimes of man. 
Death is in the Air by Kate Kingsbury from 2001. This is the second in her Manor House series. This is a fun series. They are set during World War II in a small English village and the main character is Elizabeth Hartley Compton. A German pilot crash lands and escapes into the nearby woods. Locals are in a panic, but Lady Elizabeth caught a good glimpse of the fellow as he parachuted down and he seemed nothing more than a harmless, terrified young boy. Until a local girl is found murdered the very day he disappears. Coincidence? The constable thinks not, but Elizabeth suspects everyone's jumping to conclusions. In a Gilded Cage by Reese Bowen. This is from 2009 and it is the eighth in her Molly Murphy series. This is a series set in the early 1800s in New York. This one is Easter Sunday 1918. An Irish immigrant Molly Murphy has agreed to march down Fifth Avenue with the sign wielding suffragettes from Vassar. A civil act of protest that lands her in jail. Her boyfriend, police captain Daniel Sullivan, manages to spring her from the clink, <laughs> though his hands are full dealing with opium gangs. But as soon as she's free, Molly marches straight into trouble again. Two of the Vassar alumni need Molly's help as a private investigator. One believes her uncle is cheating her out of an inheritance. The other suspects her husband is cheating with other women. And when one of the clients dies, presumably from influenza, which is sweeping the city, Molly takes to the streets once more. Silent in the Grave by Deanna Rayburn. This is from 2007, and it's the first in her Lady Julia Gray series. And this book has one of the best openers ever. I love it so much. Are you ready for this? London, 1866. To say that I met Nicholas Brisbane over my husband's dead body is not entirely accurate. Edward, it should be noted, was still twitching upon the floor. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. Um, so yes, Sir Edward Gray had hired Nicholas Brisbane um, to protect him from some threats that he was receiving, um, but uh, as we know from that first sentence, Nicholas did not protect him so very well. <laughs> A Metropolitan Murder by Lee Jackson. This is from 2004 and it's the first in this series. The last train of the night pulls into the gaslit platform of Baker Street Underground Station. A young woman is found strangled, her body abandoned in a second-class carriage. This is set, um, this is also set in the Victorian times in Victorian London. Malice at the Palace by Rhys Bowen. This is from 2015 and it's the ninth in her Royal Spiness series. The main character here is Lady Georgiana Rannoch. 35th in line to the throne, um, and she becomes embroiled in some royal wrongdoing. Caught between my high birth and empty purse, I am relieved to receive a, receive a new assignment from the Queen. The King's youngest son, George, is to wed Princess Marina of Greece, and I shall be her companion, showing her the best of London and dispelling any rumors about George's libertine history. Closed Casket by Sophie Hanna. This is the second in her Hercule Poirot series um, from 2016. What I intend to say to you will come as a shock. With these words, Lady Athelinda Playford springs a surprise on the lawyer entrusted with her will. As guests arrive for a party at her Irish mansion, mansion Lady Playford has decided to cut off her two children without a penny and leave her vast fortune to an invalid who has only weeks to live. Among Lady Playford's visitors are two strangers, the famous Hercule Poirot and Inspector Edward Catchpool of Scotland Yard. The Solitary House by Lynn Shepherd. This is from 2012 and it's the second in her Charles Maddox series. This is also called Tom All Alone's. 
London, 1850. In the gaslit world of Dickens, Charles Maddox had been an up-and-coming officer for the Metropolitan Police until a charge of insubordination abruptly ended his career. Now, he struggles to eke out a living by tracking down criminals. To his shock, Charles has been approached by Edward Tulkinghorn, a shadowy and feared attorney who offers him a handsome price to do some sleuthing for a client. A powerful financier has been receiving threatening letters, and Tulkinghorn wants Charles to find whoever is responsible. And then I've got a couple in The Sorrowful Mysteries of Brother Athelstan by Paul Doherty. This is The House of Shadows from 2003. It's the tenth in the series. And The Field of Blood from 1999. It's the ninth in the series. These are set in London in the 1300s. Brother Athelstan is a priest of St. Erkenwald's in medieval Southwark. He is praying for a quiet week when he is interrupted by a cry of murder. Hurrying outside, he is confronted by the horrific sight of three mutilated corpses lying on the church steps. Law dictates that if a killer is not found, the entire parish will be punished. And then the House of Shadows is set in late autumn of 1380 and they are preparing for the annual Christmas mystery play when a series of brutal murders occur at a Southwark tavern. The Bloody Tower by Carola Dunn. This is from 2007 and it's the 16th in her Daisy Dalrymple series. This is set in 1925. Daisy is working on a series of articles about the Tower of London, and she agrees to an overnight visit in order to witness the centuries-old tradition, um, the ceremony of the keys. The next morning, the body of a yeoman warder is found murdered. And then a couple from Sharon K. Pemmins Justin De Quincey series. This is Cruel as the Grave from 1998. It's the second in that series. And then Dragon's Lair from 2003. So we have uh, England 1193. King Richard the Lionheart languishes in a German prison and treason sets the air. Richard's younger brother, John, seizes Windsor Castle, and Dowager Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine summons her trusted personal Queen's man, Justin de Quincey, to do the impossible, meditate, mediate a truce with her rebel son. Amid such fateful events, the murder of a Welsh peddler's daughter seems small, but the cruel demise of the beautiful Melan Melangel... Uh, soon, so troubles Justin that not even a threatened French invasion can keep him from investigating her death. And in Dragon's Lair, it is July 1193, so same year, just a few months apart, Richard Lionheart is still languishing in a German dungeon held for ransom by the Holy Roman Emperor. In England, his brother John, desperate for the crown, plots with the King of France to make sure that Richard never leaves his prison alive. But the Queen has already begun to meet the ransom demands. It is only a matter of time before the Emperor turns over his royal prisoner. And then, one of the ransom payments vanishes in the fastnesses of Wales, itself wracked by rebellion and intrigue. Into this maelstrom, Eleanor sends her trusted man, Justin de Quincey. Murder soon follows. And then finally in this category is A Murder in a Mill Town by P.B. Ryan from 2004. This is the second in her Gilded Age series, uh, set in 1868 Boston uh, with main character Governess Nell Sweeney. This again is a really great series. There's only six too, so if you're looking for a shorter series to binge, this is a good option. The low-born Fallons haven't come to the Hewitt household for a handout. They've come for help, the kind of help only Nell Sweeney can give. Their wayward daughter Bridget is missing, and they don't know whether she's gone off with her brute of a boyfriend or if she's met, met a bad end. Okay, let's get into some classic crime, vintage crime, golden age mysteries. 
The Salt Marsh Murders by Gladys Mitchell. This is from 1932 and it's the fourth in her Mrs. Bradley series. Noel Wells, curate in the sleepy village of Saltmarsh, likes to spend his time dancing in the study with the vicar's niece, until one day the vicar's unpleasant wife discovers her unmarried housemaid is pregnant, and trouble begins. It is left to Noel to call for the help of sometime detective and full-time Freudian Mrs. Bradley. Death in the Tunnel by Miles Burton. This is from 1936. On a dark November evening, Sir Wilfred Saxonby is traveling alone on the five o'clock train from Cannon Street in a locked compartment. The train slows and stops inside a tunnel, and by the time it emerges again minutes later, Sir Wilfred has been shot dead. His a Long Fatal Love Chase by Louisa May Alcott. Now, this is not Little Women. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who love Little Women may be shocked uh, to, to learn that she wrote this, and she wrote this actually before she wrote Little Women. This was not published, however, until 1995. A story of dark love and passionate obsession that was considered too sensational to be published in the author's lifetime. It was written for magazine serialization in 1866, two years before Little Women. From Parisian garret to mental asylum, from convent to chateau, as Tempest stalks every step of the fiery beauty who has become his obsession. The Nursing Home Murder by Naya Marsh from 1935. This is the third in her Roderick Allen series. Um, the murder happens in theater during a surgery. So the Glimpses of the Moon by Edmund Crispin from 1977. This is the ninth and last of his Dr. Gervais Fenn series. When a decapitated head is seen floating down the river in the Devon village of Aller, the rural calm is shattered. Soon the corpses are multiplying and the entire community is involved in the hunt for the murderer. Whilst many false Whilst many chase false trails, it is left to Gervais Fenn, Oxford Dawn, an amateur criminologist, to uncover the sordid truth. Murder Underground by Mavis Doriel Hay from 1934, set in and around the northern line of the London Underground. When Mrs. Poggleton is found murdered on the stairs of Belsize Park Station, her fellow boarders in the Frampton Hotel are not overwhelmed with grief at the death of a tiresome old woman. But they all have their theories about the identity of the murderer and help to unravel the mystery of who killed the wealthy Pongle. The Swimming Pool by Mary Roberts Reinhardt from 1952. When beautiful young Judith Maynard left the Birches, it was to marry a fabulously wealthy older man who swore to make her every dream come true. But when she returned to the old family mansion, her lovely face was hollow-cheeked, her eyes nervous with terror, her marriage mysteriously shattered, her dream turned into a nightmare. Yet she would reveal to no one what strange curse had blighted her life, and now had turned this, her last refuge, into a deadly trap. Mystery in the Channel by Freeman Wills Crofts from 1931. The Chichester is making a routine journey across the English Channel on a pleasant afternoon in June when the steamer's crew notice something strange. A yacht bobbing about in the water ahead of them appears to have been abandoned and there is a dark red stain on the deck. Two bodies later, with no sign of a gun, there certainly is a mystery in the channel. Inspector French soon discovers a world of high-powered banking, luxury yachts, and international double dealing. British and French coastal towns, harbors, and of course the channel itself provide an alluring backdrop to this nautical adventure along with a cast of shady characters. Okay, let's move into some police procedurals or private investigators. This is Death in the Truffle Wood by Pierre Magnin 
from 1978. This was translated from the French by Patricia Clancy. Banon is a small village in Upper Provence and the community, their principal source of income is from truffles. Um, and then a body is found in a freezer at the local hotel and then more bodies are found in a family vault in the cemetery and the inspector must investigate. This Way Out by Sheila Radley from 1989. This is the seventh in her Inspector Quantrill series. Eric Cartwright had always considered himself a decent, honorable man. The thought of doing away with his mother-in-law would never have entered his head if he had not begun to suffer from bad dreams and if he had not met Hugh Packer. Packer offers to rid him of his unwanted relative in return for a similar favor. The monstrous suggestion gradually takes a grip of Derek's soul and events take on a deadly momentum of their own. Glass Houses by Louise Penny from 19, 19, 2017 and it's the 13th in her Armangamash series. A mysterious figure arrives in Three Pines, stands unmoving, staring ahead. Then the figure vanishes overnight and a body is discovered. The Way Through the Woods by Colin Dexter. This is from 1992 and it's the 10th in his Inspector Morse series. Morse is enjoying a rare if unsatisfying holiday in Dorset when the first letter appears in the Times. A year before, a stunning Swedish student disappeared from Oxfordshire, leaving behind a rucksack with her identification. As the lady was dishy, young, and traveling alone, the Thames Valley police suspected foul play. But without a body and with precious few clues, the investigation ground to a halt. Now it seems that someone who can hold back no longer is composing clue-laden poetry that begins an enthusiastic correspondence among England's newsreading public. The Water Room by Christopher Fowler from uh, 2004, and this is the second in his um, Bryant and May series, his Peculiar Crimes Unit series. How can an elderly recluse drown in a chair in her otherwise dry basement? That's what John May and Arthur Bryant of London's Peculiar Crimes Unit set out to discover in a city rife with shady real estate developers, racist threats, dodgy academians, Acad academicians <laughs> and someone dangerously obsessed with Egyptian mythology. Linking them all is an evil lurking in London's vast and forgotten underground river system. A killer with the eerie ability to strike anywhere, anytime, without leaving a trace. The Bones in the Attic by Robert Barnard from 2001. Moving into an upmarket new home in Leeds, rising radio star Matt Harper is shocked to find the skeleton of a small child in the attic. His grisly discovery takes him back to the summer of 1969 when he lived with his aunt only a few streets away, reawakening dim, disquieting memories from his childhood. And then finally, Malice on the Moors by Graham Thomas. This is from 1999 and it's the third in his Erskine Powell series. On a remote fog enshrouded estate in the North York Moors, a murderer lays a cunning trap. The prey, it seems, is Dickie Dinsdale, the greedy landowner who bulldozes people's lives like so many old barns. And then um, a, one from the amateur sleuth category, and this is Bones Under the Beach Hut by Simon Brett. This is from 2011, and it's the 12th in his Feathering series. The affluent seaside resort of Smalting is unaccustomed to crime, so when human remains are found beneath the floorboards of one of its beach huts, the community is awash with suspicion and fear. Amateur sleuth Carol Seddon and her best friend Jude are drawn into the mystery. And then a cozy Down the Garden Path by Dorothy Canal. This is from 1985 and she calls it a pastoral mystery, which of course means um, pastoral is an idealized version of country life. <laughs> 
Tessa Fields left on the vicar's doorstep 21 years ago is determined to uncover her true origins. It's a mystery she's certain can be solved in this quaint village of Flaxby Mead and in the company of two elderly ladies, Mrs. Hyacinth and Primrose Tramwell. With the reluctant assistance of her secret love, Harry Harkness, Tessa hits upon a scheme that finds her feigning amnesia and recovering in the Tramwell's ancestral home, Cloisters. But it isn't long before Tessa smells a rat. Why does Butler, the butler, creep around in his socks and what was he doing in her closet? How does Chantel, the sensual and elusive maid, know all about Tessa and even more about Harry? And why are these little old ladies so fiendishly good at cards? It soon becomes apparent that the game being played out in this proper English town isn't poker or whist, it's murder. And with the deck stacked against her, Tessa must unmask the perpetrator before she's dealt a fatal hand. And then a couple in the other category. This is The Cutting Room by Louise Welsh from 2002. This was the winner of the Crime Writers Association John Creasy Memorial Dagger Award. When Rilke, a desolate and promiscuous auctioneer, comes upon a hidden collection of violent and highly disturbing photographs, he feels compelled to unearth more about the deceased owner who coveted them. What follows is a compulsive journey of discovery, decadence, and deviousness steered by the sardonic Rilke's carnal urges and insatiable dark curiosity. Shocking and deliciously original, the cutting room combines the elements of a detective story with shades of the gothic as it moves through the back alleys of Glasgow. And finally, The Big Over Easy by Jasper Ford. This is from 2005 and it's the first in his nursery crime series. Jasper Ford writes, um, I would call them genre blends, like they, they are mysteries, but they are also, I don't know, fantasy, science fiction, I'm not sure um, what the, um, uh, which specifically they would be, but um, it's definitely a world where you just have to go with it, and Jasper Ford is fantastic. So, welcome to the seedy underbelly of nursery crime. Meet Inspector Jack Spratt, family man and head of Redding's nursery crime division. He's investigating the murder of ovoid D-class nursery celebrity Humpty Dumpty, ex-convict and lover of women, found shattered to death beneath a wall in a shabby area of town. Yes, the big egg is down and all those brittle pieces sitting in the morgue point to foul play. Spratt and his new partner, Sergeant Mary Mar Sergeant Mary, Mary search through Humpty's sordid past in hopes of finding the key to his death. Before long, Jack and Mary find themselves immersed in a bizarre case that reaches into the highest echelons of Reading society and business. So there you have it. There are some more recommendations for you for the prompt of space. I hope you found something here that piqued your interest. Have you read any of these books? I would love to chat with you about them in the comment section down below. Okay, it's time for the next round of the M&M Manuscript Matchup. Now, I'm gonna give this a good, good shake. Let's find out. Green. Green gives us the time period. Orange gives us 1920 to 1950. Interesting. So the book that we find needs to be set or written between 1920 and 1950. Brown gives us, again, miscellaneous. Very exciting. And red, red gives us food. All right, so for this round, we need to find a book that is written or set between 1920 and 1950 and has something to do with food. Good luck. Put your answers in the comment section down below. I would love to know what you find for these prompts, and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.